to start the class by reviewing the example we started in the prior class. And I know this from prior experience that when we start to look at costing units that have differences in materials different from the base case and made from pre oh, that are made to withstand pressures and operated temperatures different from the base case, that it can get confusing about where the various costs are and, and how we should calculate them. So it's normal that there's a bit of confusion. I'm actually really glad that the timing has worked well, that there's been a tutorial in the middle for you to work through that as a group. And so what we're looking at in today's class really is just more of a revision than, um, than anything else. So I just wanted to point out that on slide 131 in your notes is where this uh, slide is, is that eight-point procedure, the same eight-point procedure that was covered in the tutorial. Um, just so that you know where to look for it for reference. And we're going to work through the prior example. I'll just quickly recap the previous steps we did were in fact steps one, two, three, four, and five. And we ended off the class by focusing on step six. So I'll just quickly recap those steps again because I know that in the prior class and it was intentional, I didn't follow this explicitly. I didn't want it to look like it's just a formulaic procedure that we follow. I really wanted there to be some careful thought. But um, this formula or this procedure then really makes sure we account for everything. So let's, let's just go look back at that prior example again. And I'll write it up here on the board. So we were essentially costing a heat exchanger That was uh, 70 meters squared. That was our goal. And the heat exchanger was required to operate at a pressure of 5.6 MPA and operate, uh, sorry, and made from 316 stainless steel. Okay. So we spent the pre previous class then essentially following that formula that I had there up on the board, and I'll just uh, use these numbers then to illustrate that part one is to find the correlation. So in your, if you were doing this work in a spreadsheet or um, in any written form, you would record where your correlation came from. And in that case, it came from Woods, and it was page 5.5. Five. Okay? And it matches. It was for a floating head heat exchanger. And that was, in fact, what we saw there on page 5.5. Five. You may have the handout then in front of you, and you'll see that the diagram of a floating head heat exchanger. What is a floating head heat exchanger? What are we costing out here? What's the difference? Maybe let's ask it this way. What's the difference between a unit that doesn't have a floating head heat exchanger? What is the purpose of that <coughs> floating head? Okay. Please go research that. This is, we shouldn't ever be just applying these things to equipment and without real careful thought. So if you don't know what that is, look it up. Much like the flash vessel, it still kind of always amazes me that people are in fourth and fifth year and don't really know what a flash vessel does. It's one of the most basic chemical engineering units, but people often don't even know what visually, if they walk past one in a chemical plant, may not realize what it is. Okay, so, so look that up in your own time. The second part of the procedure is to check if the correlation range is okay. And we spent substantial time doing that last time, so I won't repeat that step. The third part in the procedure is to check or read off, I should say, the, the database cost. And in this case, the base cost, we called it, um, using this notation, FOB in 1970 for the unit B was $8,000. But that was for 100 meters squared. So that's my, my reference heat exchanger. And this doesn't need to come from woods, right? That number could come from anywhere. 
it happens that Dr. Woods gives you a value in his table, but if you have a reference cost in a different year for a different size unit internal to your company, you should use that instead. Right? There's no reason why you can't substitute a different unit for the one that he has in his table. This is the insight from these tables. Why we look at these tables rather than just simply using Aspen and clicking a button to get capital costs is to recognize that these database entries, we can scale up and scale down from any prior known unit. And in fact, the assignment had a question on that this week. So Woods gives us a value, but we could use a different one over here if we had a knowledge from our internal company records. The fourth step in the procedure is to then adjust that database value for our situation. It's almost never going to be the case that the value we look up matches our unit. And so we spent last class also finding the 1970s value for our desired unit A as opposed to the reference unit B as following that ratio of 8,000. And we ratio according to the factor that we're scaling up against, in this case surface area, and we use an exponent 0.71. That exponent 0.71 is applicable for heat exchangers in general. Remember I showed you how Woods calculated the, that exponent by plotting a variety of heat exchangers um, areas versus cost and found an exponent of 0.71. So again, emphasizing that you could sub in any other heat exchanger and still use a 0.71 exponent. Don't use 6 tenths. We've got information that's better than that. So let's use the 0.71 instead. And uh, that gave us our value we found last time, 6210. Okay. I'm, this number, 6210, then, is essentially a heat exchanger in 1970 for our size. But we haven't yet adjusted it for pressure or for materials. This number is going to be, come up so frequently, I'm going to give it a shorthand C0, it's the initial cost. And we're going to reference everything from that cost. So maybe just off here on the side, we'll tally up our numbers. We're going to have this base cost, C0, and that so far is 6210. We're going to add several costs together to get the total. Okay, there's going to be four, four numbers that we add up there eventually. So there's our first one. Now, the fifth step is to apply the bare module factor, recognizing that the unit doesn't exist in isolation. We have all sorts of other things around it to help that unit work. And essentially, what that comes down to is the bare module cost is equal to that base cost, C0, times the FBM, F bare module factor. So 6210 times 3.14 was the bare module factor for this heat exchanger. Sorry, 3.14 is the value for all heat exchangers, I should say. And that cost then is 19,500. Okay. But that bare module cost includes the cost of the unit as well as the cost to get it into the bare module. So we can back out then the installation cost so when I say installation here, I use that very loosely to cover everything related to getting the unit up and running. So building foundations for it, installing the piping, the electrical hookups, sensors, um, insulation, and painting, and so forth. So that installation cost is the, the difference simply between 19,500 and the base unit, 6,210. And this is a cost 13,290. That's a cost we incur on our side. We pay that to ourselves, to our own company workers, to get that unit up and running. Maybe some third party laborers, but the key is this does not go to the supplier of the equipment. The heat exchanger supplier doesn't come and install it for us. We do that at our expense. And so that installation cost is 13290 <coughs> Okay. 
Another way you can see that is let's just uh, take that formula. We can write that as C naught times FBM minus C naught. Okay, and that's why, why you'll sometimes see the formula in the notes there. I'll just write it up here a little bit more clearly. C naught and then in brackets FBM minus 1. Okay, so that's that incremental amount we're paying internally. So one way to, to write that is maybe the base cost, this money goes to the vendor, and this money is internal. You're, you're still paying them. The point is that it's not going to the vendor. That's my, I'm emphasizing what money do you pay to your supplier versus what money do you pay other people. These, actually, all these costs are, um, are ineligible. They're capital costs, right? So you get to depreciate all of these four costs. Installation. installation is also depreciable. Okay, that's a good point uh, Mark is raising. At the end, this number we calculate over here, that becomes your book value, right? And that's also why we want that number. Obviously, by the time this actually occurs, you'll know exactly what that is. Right now, this is just an estimate. Okay, so that's step five. Step six was the one step now where we start to adjust for materials and for, um, for pressure. So let's do that quick. Now, we can look up the material and pressure factor for this unit. So in step six, the pressure factor we look up is 1.52, and the material factor for stainless is 3.0. Okay. So to upgrade the unit from its basic configuration to withstand greater pressures and to be made from a better material, we're going to pay C naught times FP times FM dollars. Okay. So this is going to be our total cost for the unit. So six two one zero times 1.52 times 3.0, which gets you a number of 28,320. Okay. But notice here, I'm taking the base unit and I'm multiplying it by these two multipliers. What I can do is I can back out again the incremental cost to upgrade. So like I did here for installation, I can back out the incremental upgrade cost. So maybe let's call this the the upgrade cost okay, is then 28,320 minus the 6,210, the base price. And so that is 22,110. Another way I could have got that is by simply saying C naught times FP times FM minus C naught. And that simplifies to C naught times FP, FM minus 1. It's just a different restatement of that. Okay, so back to that uh, increasing price list here. Now we can add a new entry called upgrade. That's 22,110, and that money goes to the vendor. Okay, so right now we're paying our vendor 6210 plus 22,000. That's a total of 28,000. That's what we're paying our supplier. Okay, so in other words, our supplier is going to get C naught times CP times C, uh, sorry, C naught times FP times FM, $28,000 from us. Okay, and then the final step to upgrade is the fact that not only do we upgrade our unit, we also have to upgrade the piping and other components inside the bare module. Right? After all, if we're upgrading the, pressure, the, the piping to withstand a higher pressure um, inside the bare module, sorry, if we're upgrading the piping in the heat exchanger, we should be upgrading the piping in the bare module to withstand that same degree of pressure. Similarly for the materials. 
It might be that we're pumping a food grade product and we need stainless steel. So you wouldn't just upgrade your heat exchanger and then run your food through carbon steel pipes after that. Everything in the bare module is also updated or most of them, the piping in the bare module is updated. So let me just quickly show how you might naively do this. You might naively say, well, if I'm gonna, if it's gonna be this way to upgrade my, my unit, take C naught and multiply it by those two, a naive way would be to say, take C naught times FP times FM times FBM. Okay, and say that's going to be my cost to upgrade my bare module. Well, that's not really fair to do that because this FBM factor is a whole lot more than just the piping inside the bare module. Let me uh, perhaps write it for you this way. Is to emphasize that that bare module factor is made up of a number of components. And we could write it, for example, as follows. FBM is equal to a function of the unit itself. And that's always taken as 1.0. And then there's a part related to the piping. And for heat exchangers, that's 0.46. There's a part related to concrete. And for heat exchangers, that's 0 0.05. And there's a part related to steel. So structural supports and so forth, 0.03 and so forth. There's a variety of sub portions that make up that bay module factor so that you get to a number here that's equal to 3.14. Okay, so the interpretation is that every dollar you spend on the heat exchanger, the unit, you're also spending 46 cents on the piping and 5 cents on the concrete and 3 cents on the steel and so forth. And there's engineering and a few other top um, entries that add up to get 3.14. Okay, so a better way then to adjust for our internal upgrade inside the bare module is to say, well, we don't need to upgrade the unit. We've already accounted for that. The concrete supports are likely going to be the same concrete supports for the new exchanger versus the base case. So forth for the steel and engineering and all the others. Really the only entry there is the 0.46. So a better and accu more accurate estimate of our upgrade cost, so let's maybe call this our internal or bare module upgrade cost is equal to C naught times FP times FM. We're gonna back out the cost of the unit itself. So we're only gonna upgrade incrementally and then multiply here by F pipe. Okay. No, it does, it, it, that, this here, that's the upgrade price you're paying to the vendor for the better heat exchanger, but you have to upgrade parts inside your bare module as well. So that's where we have to, so we take this incremental price, this is how much extra I'm paying the vendor, so if I'm paying the vendor this much extra, some ratio of it, or some factor of it, F pipe is the cost for your internal upgrade. So the one for price, is that external upgrade? Yeah, well, uh, it's, this is, so this is the vendor upgrade. Okay. We're still in step five. Step five is several subparts. There's the vendor upgrade and there's our internal upgrade.
going to take this. This is a dollar figure, $22,000. And I'm going to multiply it by 0.46. So taking about 46% of 22,000. Yeah, I'm going to add it to the total. Okay. So there's one other potential issue here is that when we say we're upgrading the piping, we're not upgrading necessarily all of the piping. Inside the Bay module and in the assignment, I'd ask you to consider and look at pictures of installed heat exchangers and consider which piping would and would not be upgraded. So typically what we'll say is let's recognize that there'll be an another, another factor here which we call psi. So there's a, another multiplier. Maybe let me just write it out a bit more carefully here. C naught times FP FM minus 1 times F pipe times psi. So there's four terms in a row. And psi is a number that's between 70% and 100%. Based on experience, right, so certain units, you would know that you'd need to upgrade all your piping to match the new piping of the unit. Other units, you might say, well, I don't need to upgrade everything. It's just some fraction of it. Is it, is it always safe to assume that, that the piping is the only factor that's going to change with increased pressure or increased material? Mostly, yeah. Okay. So never multiply uh, the bare module factor by the increased cost due to, due to uh, upgrading. So all we're saying is we say what we're going to take, what we're going to pay extra to our <laughs> supplier, our vendor, that's yeah. that term over there, and multiply it by F pipe. Right, but never, never take that new cost. Like you, you found a new upgraded cost and then never multiply that just by a PM. Right, because, no, no, you'll get a huge overestimate then, okay. right? Because that 3.14 is made up of several parts, many of which are not going to be upgraded. Now, of course, if there is a part, like let's say you know that the steel will also have to be upgraded, then absolutely add that in. Right, and then that becomes a slightly bigger number. But what happens is that I see people like fighting over and arguing about these distinctions. It's all within the round of error that you're arguing about. Right? Remember, we've got estimates at the end that are plus or minus 40%. No, there's a reason why we'll do it separately, and I'll show you why when we look at some of the, the graphical versions. Okay. Okay, so if we sub in a number here, um, so let's just note, you might want to just note there that psi is a number that's typically as much as 1 or as low as 0.7. Um, if you sub in the values for this particular example, you get an answer here for our internal upgrade of 7,120. Okay, so, so our a module upgrade is 7,120. And those four numbers then add up to 48,730. Now, this is all in 1970. We haven't, up, we haven't moved yet to, to today's dollars. Yeah, Tabo? 0.7. Yeah. Yeah, I used 0.7. Sorry? That's for you to answer in the tutorial. Okay, so the final step then is once you've got that 1970s value is to bring it up to today's money. And as I said in, in the tutorial is let's stick with CEPCI. Marshall and Swift is not available to us. Also, the, the most recent CEPCI value you can update to is 2013. 2014 is not finished yet, so CEPCI for 2014 is not available. So you can only, you, we always lag one year. So the best you can do is estimate costs for 2013. And uh, so you can look that up on the course website. 
and bring it up to today's dollars. And once you have it in today's dollars, you add 40%, subtract 40%, and you report a range. Okay? So your answer will be, um, I don't have the, the values for the 2013 CEPCI here with me, but um, your answer is reported as dollar bear module 2013, and it will be some upper bound and some lower bound that you'll report your answer as. Okay. That's your total bare module cost, 48,700. Yeah. Okay, so a heat exchanger that originally cost $6,000, once all said and done and upgraded and installed, ends up costing quite a bit more. Okay, so those quotes that you get from vendors for basic units are very, very low estimates. Once you've upgraded them for higher pressures, higher material strengths, um, they can substantially inflate, is the, one of the key messages I want to take from this. Okay, so what I wanted to do then was um, just talk in the rest of the class perhaps a bit about the tutorial and the assignment. Um, one thing is, of course, um, we do expect you to keep your logbooks up to date, right? So we've noticed a few groups that just simply enter in or haven't been keeping them up to date or just enter them in just on the day of. But that's, you really are defeating the purpose of what that is about. It's there to keep track of who's responsible for what. Um, also, I want you to be thinking, and I'm going to ask you then to this coming week to look at the criteria that your group have selected between yourselves on how you're going to judge each other's work. Okay, so one, one of the concerns I had was that you guys gave, not you guys, but for the most part, uh, groups gave each other um, points for being present. Right, so four out of 20 marks for showing up. Well, you really should be giving each other's negative marks. Right, so it should be minus four if you don't show up and you should be zero for just being there, right? No one gives you an award for coming to work. So the, the idea is, and it is quite serious, I, I, as many of you groups have been seeing, I take attendance and participation quite seriously there in the tutorials because one person not showing up puts 25% extra workload on everyone else, right? In this tutorial, you should have been able to finish the entire tutorial in today's period. Um, and this tutorial is part of the midterm, so by not being there and not assisting your group, you're essentially pulling your whole group down. So just uh, bear that participation aspect in mind going forward. So what I wanted to do then was just go through some of the issues in the tutorial. Um, I'll just bring it up here. Let's find it quick. Okay, I, I actually don't have it here on this laptop. It's on my desktop computer. So what I'll do is um, we'll just cover it uh, verbally then. So the, first uh, the, the main question was on the plants selling propylene pellets. Um, the main issues that I wanted you to consider there was simply use your turnover ratio. Okay. The next question is on the heat exchanger that cost $145,000 in 2000. Any questions or issues related to that? So a heat exchanger in 2000, it cost $145,000. You're buying a new one that's 1.8 times larger. Okay, no concerns. Um, so the next question five was on the heat exchanger breakdown uh, eight steps which is really what we just covered here in class was these eight steps now. And I'd asked you to, to focus, particularly in question four, uh, pay attention there. It says, how much extra do we pay the supplier, right? That's, 
that portion there. And then question four, how much extra do we pay internally for unpacking, um, installation, foundations, electrical? And that was how much? In uh, the, we're, we're going through the tutorial. What's the extra cost for unpacking the heat exchanger for the electrical and utility hookups when you've upgraded the pressure in that heat exchanger? Okay. Zero dollars, okay. Yes, no. I don't see any heads agreeing, disagreeing. Everyone's brain dead on Friday. <laughs> yeah? Sorry? No. Anyone else want to volunteer why it's zero? Yeah? Yeah? Right. Okay. So, um, question five then, or part five asks, to um, look, essentially it breaks down that 70% idea that we've just discussed over here. And you'll need to go look at some pictures to get an idea of what pipes get upgraded and, and don't. Any suggestions? Any groups had a chance to do that? No? I didn't any, get any questions on this in the tutorial, so I assumed it's straightforward. Okay, so I'm still assuming that because I'm not getting questions now. Um, part six then asks to report the total bill broken down in four parts and essentially that's that being demonstrated over there. Okay, question six is a variation on costing except we're using graphical techniques for it. Now, just uh, one thing to notice is that these plots are in pounds, pounds sterling, and they're at a certain point in time, 1979. Okay, so you need to exchange your currency. Do you exchange your currency in 2013 or do you exchange your currency in 1979? And then you're going to apply an inflation factor, right? Devin? Okay. Okay. Okay, is there a British version of the CEPCI? I don't know, but you can get a conversion rate about 1970 from pounds to Canadian dollars. You can just convert to Canadian dollars from 1970 and then use the CEPCI to convert from 1970 to 2013. Okay. Yeah, so uh, be careful, it's not Canadian dollars. All these figures are in US dollars that we've been dealing with, yeah? So yes, convert your currency first in 79 to, from sterling to US dollars. And that, those data are easily available online. And then bring your data up, then bring your price estimate up to today's value using the, the, the CEPCI. Okay, uh, the... Okay, so yes, the, it seems like those graphs have, have fewer information, but they actually have mostly everything there, right? So these slopes are with that exponent n. They're log-log plots, so they're, they're straight lines with the exponent n. Um, they also have various lines over here for different materials. Those are your material factors and your pressure factors. The one thing to be, be aware of, though, is that that's the purchase cost, okay? So when they say purchase cost, they're essentially, you're estimating that number plus that number. There's no estimate of installation and bare module price in there, right? So that step should also be taken into account in general. You don't need to do it for this tutorial, but I wanted you to be aware of that for these, 
the use of these curves is that it's the purchase price is your upgrade cost plus the base cost is, is wrapped up in that. You'll still need a bare module factor. Yeah. Okay, so if you're estimating a heat exchanger price from this graph, what's your bare module factor? Where would you look for a bare module number? You don't need it for this tutorial, but let's say you wanted to estimate, rather than estimate your purchase price, but you wanted to estimate this number instead. So you need some way to calculate the installation cost. What's a bare module factor that you'd use? Right. Right. So Woods' table is, is informative because it gives you that bare module factor and it applies to all heat exchangers. So the exponent n and the bare module number. Okay. So this is why we teach the Woods method. Because it has this additional information. Yeah. Another question about that number six. Um, you're asking, asking us to compare from the graph to the number before. Yeah. Um, we know the error on the number five question, but we don't have any, or do we have, I guess, any idea of what the error is on that graph? Right, yeah. Do we have any idea of the error on this graph? That's a good question. Right. So I was looking for it in the textbook. I took it from, I couldn't find error. I would again just assume plus or minus 40%, but the, we're not given that error information. Yeah, so talk about it in, the, in terms of the ranges. Yeah. Okay. Question seven you would have noticed was for a flash vessel. I think I have that, um, that diagram here for flash vessels. There were some comments I wanted to make here on flash vessels. Okay, there we go. Okay, so a flash vessel, um, not sure why this is cut off, let's see. Okay, so a flash vessel, there we have several types here on this page. There's the the horizontal flash vessels is shown there, but we're dealing with a vertical one, uh, which is just really this part down at the bottom. Now, you'll notice that there are three options for costing it. Um, essentially, this stretch over here that refers to costing it in terms of length times diameter to the 1.5. There's costing in terms of volume, and then there's costing in terms of the bare weight of the vessel in pounds. So you would select the one that you have the information available for. And most commonly, you'd know the dimensions of the unit, so the length or the, and the diameter, and from which you can obviously calculate the volume. So really, in this particular instance, the first two are the most applicable to you. There is an additional piece of guidance that you see there from the error. This first correlation has error of 50%. The next correlation is error of 40 so that makes the second correlation a little more desirable. Um, and then finally to point out these awkward units and how to use it. Let's, let's double check here. The units are given to you as length times diameter to the 1.5. So what that means is... We first need to calculate that particular value for our unit. Okay. So we, we calculate L times D to the 1.5 for our unit, and we will get a certain number. Okay. And I think in the tutorial, that number is around 15. Now you will see here that a little bit cut off here and I'm going to have to move this thing up and down constantly to show you but essentially the the base is a hundred well let me move it down just to emphasize that this is important okay so the base unit that's costed for us has a hundred times 
in these units and costs $4,800. So it says a vessel that happens to have some sort of length and diameter that when you multiply and calculate the length times diameter to the 1.5 and you get an answer of 100, that that unit of that configuration would cost 4,800. But when you calculate the range to verify that this correlation is accurate for you, it doesn't mean that you have to take and divide through what your number is and divide it through by 100 and check that that's within the range. All it says is calculate your length, your diameter, and provided the length times diameter to the 1.5 lies within a range from 8 to 350, which is true because we've got 15, then you can go ahead and use that correlation. Okay, so it's a bit of a subtlety. Most groups kind of got to that point and sorted that out, but there were a few that didn't, and I wanted to emphasize that. Okay, so reading those tables is, a, is sometimes a bit non-obvious. Anything else on the tutorial that some of the groups might still have had questions with? Okay, here's your chance to get some answers. The tutorial is due on Tuesday this time because we're releasing the solutions for you to look at in at Tuesday night for Wednesday's midterm, which is Wednesday evening. Okay, so the usual hand-in is Wednesday morning, but we're asking for Tuesday afternoon at 4.30. Yeah? Okay, so that's it from the tutorial side. I just quickly want to go back to the notes and then we'll wrap up this section. Okay, so in the notes, there's several examples um, I'd like you to work through on your own time. There's ample practice examples here. Here's one for estimating the bare module cost for a reflux drum. So the reflux drum is a unit that, sit, that sits um, or is illustrated usually at this location in a distillation column diagram. A vertical reflux, sorry, uh, this, this horizontal reflux drum over there is um, operating at 0.3 MPA and 290 Kelvin. Yeah, total model. Okay, so it's for 57 meters cubed. Now, if we go to the table here, the closest looking device is this pressure vessel table. And for horizontal units, we notice that the units are in units of 10 to the 3 gallons. Okay, our unit is 56 meters cubed. So does our unit fall within this range of 0.1 to 80? Well, to, to do that, we need to convert to U.S. gallons and in units of 10 to the 3 U.S. gallons. In our case, that's 57 meters cubed times 264 gallons per meter cubed. And then we divide through by 1,000. So that division by 1,000 is there because... Our units are not in, in straight U.S. gallons. They're in 10 to the 3 U.S. gallons. So divide through by 1,000. We get a number that's about 15. It's less than 80, which is what the correlation is valid up to. Okay, so it's valid between 0.1 and 80. Our exponent is 0.62, and our bare module factor is 3.0. So the rest of the calculations then are straightforward from that perspective. There's no, um, no part 5 where we're upgrading the materials or pressure. Okay. So we can use the error from other units. So we, we notice that there's no error reported up here, but these units are similar in configuration for a vertical or a horizontal vessel. The technology is similar to build these units. So if we're not given this error up here of 40%, we can use the error from another unit and assume it's similar. Yeah, Brandon. No, these units are, are really just for convenience. The range check is in the original units. These units in brackets are, says, um, if you wanted to cost it, a unit that was 3.8 meters cubed would cost you 1,900. But don't use the, the metric units. Often it's the metric units that are in brackets. 
I don't use those for the range check. The range check is always done in the original unit shown. Okay, um, these slides cover topics that we've looked at really in the class earlier. I will also emphasize here on page 141 um, are the piping factors for a variety of other units. So uh, for furnaces, for there's that 0.46 we've used for a shell and tube heat exchanger. But notice that in an air-cooled heat exchanger, the piping factor is much smaller, 0.18. Okay, makes sense. An air-cooled heat exchanger doesn't require um, another shell side and a tube side hookup, so that's, that's cheaper there. Vessels, 0 0.61, 0 0.42. Pumps, I have a value of 0.3. So the bare module cost around a pump, there's just one entry and one exit pipe, so the, the piping cost is, is quite a bit smaller. Compressors and drives, and then tanks. These are just storage tanks. Okay, so this table is also interesting because you can see how the various bare module factors add up. Notice here that bare module factors for furnaces are relatively small, 2.24. Again, this is because the furnace arrives as a pre-configured unit. You basically join up your fuel source and your entry and exit piping for your cold stream entering and your warm stream leaving. And so there's really l relatively little work that gets done around that. The furnace comes pre-instrumented and, and pre-configured by the vendors often. So it's quite common to see units that are very integrated and purchased as one unit that comes with everything already included um, has a much lower bare module factor. But you'll be paying a steep price for that. So the price is expensive, but then the cost on your side to upgrade it to work inside its bare module is relatively small. Okay, and then, um, so in fact, there's the heat exchanger example we did in class together. You can see the detailed solution there for it. Here's another example. This is in, actually from the boiler house. Here's a refrigeration unit here in physical plant. Um, we used to have plant tours through there, not so much anymore, but Essentially, if we wanted to go cost a unit like that, um, these units are, excuse me, are costed based on their um, energy draw, and there's a modification for the evaporator temperature. So <coughs> let me just quickly point out on the table here that for refrigeration, um, we cost it based on energy draw, so there's kilowatts, and then there's modifier factors depending on the temperature this time. So in the past, we've seen pressure modification factors and material modification factors. This time, there's a temperature modification factor. So if we operate it at higher and lower temperatures, the units become less or more expensive. Okay, so another one for you to work through. And then um, I, there's e even another one still that I just added recently for you to go work through. This one has a materials modification factor and a pressure modification factor for a pump this time. And um, the full solution is given over the next two slides, broken down in the eight steps required over there. Okay, so lots of practice problems for you in the slides to work through. Okay, so then in Monday's class, we'll uh, do wrap up our final section. Just look for a small set of notes posted over the weekend for that.